Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. In this module, we will discuss the role of yeast culture in the transition cow diet. When evaluating yeast culture, we will look at six aspects determining how to correctly position it. First, we'll talk about its function. We will review the level that should be fed. Thirdly, its cost. Fourthly, its benefit to cost ratio. Fifthly, strategy of when to use it. And finally, our current recommendation. If we look at what its primary function as a feed additive, yeast culture should stimulate fiber digesting bacteria in the rumen. Because of that, that will stabilize the rumen environment and improve energy dynamics in the rumen. Second of all, it will reduce the production of lactic acid, a key VFA that can lead to acidosis. And thirdly, it should stabilize the rumen environment, especially during the transition period when we cannot use sodium bicarb or other buffer products. Let us look quickly at some of the new research on yeast cultures. The first study we will look at briefly is a University of Illinois study with Jersey dairy cattle. Here you can see the overall results in terms of dry matter intake prepartum, dry matter intake postpartum, those differences are modestly small, an increase in milk production with yeast culture, although that is not statistically significant, and no changes in butter, fat, milk protein, or lactose. However, if we take a closer look at dry matter intake prepartum by days before calving, a significant response occurred due to dry matter intake and day effect. You can see in the first couple of weeks prior to calving, there is no impact of yeast culture. However, as we get close to calving, we see a significant increase in dry matter intake of nearly 4 pounds per day. We did not prevent the dry matter intake seen in most close-up dry cows, but we did get a significant increase in nutrient intake during this critical time period. Then we also looked at dry matter intake after calving. In the previous slide that we looked at all time periods, that was 140 days. Again, you'll see a significant impact in the first 30 to 40 days after calving with higher dry matter intakes, which disappear at about 60 to 80 days after calving, which again gives us an idea of where we're going to see our best economic response and its role in the transition diet. We then moved to another study up in Canada done in 1996, and these were the three significant responses seen in that study compared to control cows. We saw a significant increase in dry matter intake after calving of nearly three pounds of dry matter. We saw an improvement of nearly four pounds of milk in the second and late lactation cows and an even larger milk response in first lactation cows. All of the other parameters were not significantly different. In a parallel study conducted at Canada, they also looked at some of the rumen parameters in these transition cow diets. And you can see no effect on pH with yeast culture, but interestingly, a significantly lower level of ammonia in the rumen, which would imply better capture of the ammonia and hopefully greater microbial growth and capture of the nitrogen fraction. We look at the VFA fraction, we see a 10% increase in total VFAs being produced and a trend towards higher levels of acetate versus propionate, again suggesting a stimulation of fiber digesting bacteria. In another study just recently conducted out at Washington in 300 cows, we looked at 30 weeks of feeding after calving. And over that period, we saw an increase of about 5 pounds more fat-corrected milk with a yeast culture group in this paired study. And again, notice the greatest response was seen in the first 15 weeks after calving. The last study we'll look at is a University of Wisconsin study looked at 11 commercial herds in Wisconsin when yeast culture was incorporated into the ration in a switchback design. Again, these herds are very high producing herds as you can see from the rolling herd average and there were 585 cows in this switchback design study. The average increase was 1.8 pounds of milk per cow. Eight of the 11 herds had a positive response. Notice there was no significant impact on fat test or protein, although a trend to be lower with the yeast culture animals. So then let's wrap up our yeast culture and look at our final criteria. The first one is how much should we feed? This number will vary depending on which product and which company you're using. So that range will vary from 25 to 100 grams per cow per day, depending on how concentrated the product would be and if it's a yeast or a yeast culture product itself. The typical cost is four to six cents per cow per day. Based on the research results we saw earlier, the benefit to cost ratio 
is approximately 4 to 1. The strategy of when to use this product would be especially in close-up and fresh cow diets when the diets are rapidly changing and we are transitioning cows to the high-producing ration. Cows that are off-feed when we are feeding low-quality forages to stimulate fiber digestibility and those cows that may be sick. In some cases, with sick cows, the level of yeast culture must be much higher than we have in this preventative role. Based on the research results and the economics, we would recommend the addition of yeast culture to these strategically identified groups of cows. Well, hopefully this module has given you a better idea how to strategically place yeast cultures in the transition cow diet. Thanks, and have a good day.